Hello, everyone. Hi. It's time to talk about SQL, or Squall, if you prefer, or SQL, um, the relational paradigm of data management. Uh, probably to situate this all and to make clear the distinction between relationality and non-relationality, some history is in order. Um, you may wonder why um, there's a database over here and then there's the rest of your program over there and they're separate and you do some things in the database and then you write other things in a general programming language. Um, and that gets to a lot of fundamental issues in computer science which are probably too hard to go into in detail right now, but um, the stuff over here is um, the SQL, let's call it, over here. Um, that is where you are explicitly specifying your query. You are explicitly saying what question you want the computer to answer, and the computer then you know, the software then goes and makes a plan of what data to access and in what order and what to do with it and so on to come up with an answer for your query. Um, and back in the 70s when most of the software we use today was given its present form, um, there was even less knowledge than there is now about how to do that efficiently in the general case. So they came up with uh, some restrictions on what kinds of questions you could ask um, that they knew how to plan out how to answer those questions efficiently and then that became a database and then the rest of the stuff which is unrestricted is the programming language and now they're in, and there's, there's, there's really no fundamental reason why they couldn't all be in one system, and that's actually something I'm trying to work on is uh, reuniting those two things, but um, it just kind of happened that way that that was the best people knew how to do at the time, and then, and then the, you know, personal computing happened, and everything became a big business, and people kind of took whatever the best stuff was at the time, and started teaching millions of other people about it and it, it kind of got locked in place to some extent but and and that's kind of how it came to be that that is how things are now so in addition to being an interesting way of and an often useful way of working with data this is also like a glimpse into another paradigm of programming where you get to just say what the computer is supposed to do and it figures out a lot of the details for you. Um, so that might, that is, that is definitely different from uh, the level stuff. Um, so, so there was kind of a, the, there's the NoSQL non-paradigm, which is kind of a defined as, as everything that doesn't try to do what SQL does, which is where you you don't have this system of specifying questions and then a system that comes up with a plan for you how to answer it. Instead, you just have, as you just saw, um, like a thing that you put data into and you give it a name and it just pulls it out. You put it in and take it out based on that name and everything about what data do you get and how do you use it once you have it is all up to you. And that can be empowering and useful if you're doing something where the system as it's implemented is getting in your way or um, you just want to have more control over how things are done, but it can also be um, a restriction because maybe you don't have the information that you need ahead of time and you really would want 
the computer to figure out at the last possible second how to do it because you couldn't foresee everything yourself um, entirely ahead of time. So anyway, that is, uh, and then, then here's an analogy. Um, so um, the the contrast between the two paradigms, I think you can imagine in terms of like trying to look at a painting and um, in in the one case you the painting is like your goal is to paint a certain image and the way you paint it is you pick up paint and you put it on a certain part of the canvas and you do this in a certain order so that the image comes together properly and when you learn the art of painting you learn how to do this well um, but like the painting is that final image that has all of the elements brought together in the right way and that's what you are generally focused on when you're doing something or if you're building anything there's something analogous that's going on and if you are writing down your query I think that's a lot like describing the image that you want to see and then something will figure out how to draw it for you which is kind of what uh, Substack is doing with the robot, in fact. Um, and then the way most programs are often, are usually written is kind of like painting, but you can't see the canvas and you can't see where the paint was left and you just have a video of someone taking paint off the palette and putting it somewhere, but you don't see where it's been left. So you have to like remember everything that happened and say like, okay, maybe there's some brown in a line here, so maybe that's supposed to be a tree. And that's kind of what it's like. And, and then maybe there's like some highlights. Maybe there's a, he did this, so there's, that's highlights. And there was a, some yellow in a ball over here, so maybe that's the sun. And that's kind of what it's like to read a program that doesn't explicitly state what it's trying to do, is you just see it do stuff, and you have to say, well, what is the point of this? And if you read through it and play with it and debug it, then you get a sense of what it's doing, but it's never explicit most of the time. So SQL is nice in that it lets you be explicit and can maybe lead us to more explicitude in, in how things are done. So, but right now let's, um, let's bring this down to, to bits and atoms. And um, I was thinking that we would so I, I am, I'm doing this improv style, so I, I'm hoping that there will be audience participation, and I have not prepared at all for anything, so um, we all get to put the meat in the meat grinder together to make the sausage, so um, uh, let's begin. So the overall plan I was thinking is that we would install some database software and then begin to just use its basic features and once we and you can all see how an example of how to install database software on a computer which may be more or less like your computer or not and then after that there is um, my uh, my uh, uh, silent assistant Max has uh, uh, just informed me that there is a web interface to the Wikipedia databases where you can write SQL queries that will be run on actual Wikipedia data. So that is a really cool thing to play with and you need just a web browser to do it. So I think then we'll switch over to doing that. Um, so let's begin. Um, uh, Max, would you be so kind as to install PG SQL 3, I think it is? So the the database of choice for me in general most of the time is Postgres because it usually implements things correctly, which you can't say of many databases. And it also has a lot of useful features. Like for instance, it has a JSON data type which lets you do a lot of the stuff that Level does, but you can also have all of this other relational paradigm stuff to help you out as well. So it's in a way the best of both worlds. What is going on over here? What do you want? Okay. Um, SQL3 is the, is that it? No. What is the thing called? Um, there's like a nice graphical thing and it has your tables in a table on the side and you don't have to 
remember as much. Um, oh, you know what? I think it'll recommend it if you. Uh, okay. I don't think I will. Alright, so. Yeah, let's just go to Postgres.org because that's what anyone would have to do anyway. So let's just go from. Start from the beginning. All right, so we've decided that we like a database because we read some blog post about it or we heard some guy talk about it up on a microphone. And then, so we go to the website and we do that. We do what the website says. And now we have a database running on our computer. So, P PSQL. So that's the command line client. Okay. So no, there's like a default user, and uh, it has no password, I think. But you have to do like dash u whatever. But let's look that up. I think the default user is Postgres, actually. Um, okay. Try try Postgres with no password. Now we get to look up answers to error messages online, which is another fun part of things. <laughs> okay, so what was W? No console. Oh, okay. Okay, so we have to. It, so the database has, like many operating systems, its own concept of of users and of authenticating them. So. It's a bit redundant with what the operating system is doing, but we need to find out what its default settings are. So. We may have to go into the config files. Then. So, there we go. Oh, it has first steps. Okay, great. So we're in. Um, now we have a text interface to the database. So. Um, can you show tables? So show tables is how you see what tables there are. Right, that's the yeah, I think so. What? Okay. Is that not how you do it? Maybe it's like, is it backslash no, T? In? I have the fan. Oh, are you on a, a slow thing? No. no. Okay. Oh, that's my default. Does, does this do backslash T? Let's try backslash T. Little T. Okay, that's not it. Okay. Oh no, maybe it has like a meta table of tables because they do everything with tables. So I think it's like select star from table. Is it? Nope. Okay. So let's forget about this. Let's install the graphical thing that just shows us what the tables are. Um, and that is called.
No, it's like it's like a PG admin three. That's not there we go. Control D. So now we have to connect to the database, so the way this is often um, chopped up is that um, the database is running as a server and then clients connect to it and do queries on it and it just maintains the database um, in the face of all of the querying that is going on from multiple clients, multiple sources of information and questions about that information. Uh, I don't think that's this stuff. Well, we no, it's running. It's already running. So you have to connect to it. So we have to connect to it. So we hit the plug, and now that should just be localhost, and we should be connected. Okay. The result of that login error. Okay. So let's. We have to sort out this whole like, what is the user of the database issue. It might also just be Postgres again. Let's see what it is. Okay. No password applied. Well, try Postgres. Or yeah, try what it, the wiki page tells you. I just forgot. I was just, I just solved it. Oh, uh, yeah. Set the password. All right. Why don't we do that? I think we said it to be nothing. Did you do that? I have SQL library. Oh. Cool. SQLite's another phone one. MariaDB. Honorable mention. Okay, so now we're just going to set the password. not change. What is node lesson? I was, I'm just, just the current folder. Though. Did you remove it? No. Oh. I did see the first one. Can you go to your home direction? It just, there is no. Okay, this is it. this nice left bar that tells us everything about what we want to know. So we have one database named Postgres. So the way things are structured in this is that a database is a collection of tables mainly and other things. And a table is a, uh, a set of things that you can know about something and what they are. So the columns are things you can, are things that, traits that something has, and then the rows are uh, those things and what their traits are. So you could have like an identifier and then a long name of something. Well, let's make this less hypothetical. What is something that we would like to answer questions about audience? Cooking. Um, dungeon exploration. Dungeon exploration. Um, 
people who have starred in movies with Kevin Bacon transitively. That one's actually hard. So one of the things that you cannot do in relational databases is unbounded recursion. And if you want to search in an open-ended way a set of relationships where you don't know how many steps in you have to go, that's unbounded recursion. You can't do that very easily or really at all in the relational model. So that's not to Kevin Bacon. Um, uh, OK. Um, delicious fruits. Delicious fruits. Seconded? Delicious. Yeah, seconded. Any objections? <laughs> delicious fruits it is. OK. So what what are things that we know about fruits? Let me make it no, not what is a fruit. What is a what is a trait a fruit has? Color. Okay. Color, flavor. Price. Price. Geographic region. Seasonality. Okay. Origin of provenance. Seasonality. That's a lot of things. Okay. Um, size. All right. Um, <laughs> hardness. Hardness. Whether you have to peel it. Okay. There's a lot of things we could be doing here. So let's just start off by identifying the fruits and then we'll attach additional information to fruits after we can just say like which fruit is which. So we'll start off by saying which fruit is which. So let's create a table that has an ID and a name of a fruit. So, so go into the... Um, the, the console lead of Can you make um, this a bit larger? Yeah. We actually have about a, a quarter or a third of the screen to the right that you can <coughs> Okay. Right. I didn't see that just fine. Uh, yeah. Can somebody manually adjust that so that all the projects are projecting? You want me to go to the console? Well, we're it's this thing. It's the worksheet they call it. Yeah. yeah. There it is. I wish this could be bigger. What are you trying to do? I'm trying to make it larger. Well, let's you know, I think I'm just going to decrease my resolution and then it will be bigger. Same Yeah. Not in the graphical interface. The left is. You already have the worksheet. That's a worksheet. Is it just illegible? No, it's just Substack is edging us on to do things in the most neat way possible. Okay. Well, we could use an emulator for a terminal protocol that was invented in like 1971, or we could, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. Really big. Yeah. Well, that is a that is a plus of doing it that way is that it actually has support for basic features. <laughs> so such as font size. Um, <laughs> I just want to say, I think this presentation is very representative of my experience. Yeah, well, I wanted to give an unfiltered look at what it is like to work with these kinds of tools, so. We've got that. Yeah. Well done. Like, you need to know what you're getting into and you, you know, you should at least know the way to just um, bludgeon your way through the first few obstacles that you'll encounter. <laughs> okay, so we have we have a thing that we can type queries in. Query is a funny word because that is really a synonym for question, but it also is used in this context to refer to commands that do things, such as creating a table. Or maybe people don't use that, but I think people, the error is common enough. So anyway, let's let's create table and uh, it's not create. <laughs> okay.
Okay. Well, maybe we should create a table later. Um, We're going to do it next Okay. So, and we'll call it fruit. And now we need a paren or parentheses. Okay. And um, how do we do this? So, we need a, we need a name and a type for each column. So, um, primary key ID. So a key is a unique number that refers to something uniquely and efficiently, and it is the the best and standard way to refer to a row of a table. Um, if you don't have unique entities that you want to refer to, then you don't use them, but if you do, then you do. And it lets you find them and work with them and um, associate them with one another. Okay, and then... Um, text name. Let's try that. And capitaliz and that that'll be it. So capitalization doesn't matter in this, which is. And there we go. And now, let, can we show the table? Let's see if we got that table. But it's not show tables. What is it? Let's desk fruits. D S C. Are you semicolon? In? Yeah, you haven't semicolon anything. That's just not there. Right? Yeah, okay. So create semicolon. Just like up, 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 up. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So that's what happens if you don't use the semicolon. Okay. Is it not? Oh, you know, um, what is? No, everything has primary key, doesn't it? Yeah. No, I think it. It would. Do we have the the order wrong or something on this? You didn't specify type. Like integer. No, primary key is its own. That should be implicit in. No, it's not that. Okay. Now we do the other fun thing. Is we go look it up online. Just do post Postgres primary key. Okay. So. Well, we could do in it, we could do unique integer, and that's pretty much the same as primary key. So there's an, there's something that goes on with a column can have an index on it, and um, the index is a data structure that the database builds to keep track of what rows have what in them. So if you if you specify a key for something, then it'll build an index, and it'll make and it'll use that to make sure that they're all unique, and the index also makes querying involving that much faster because it can go directly to the right row instead of looking at all the rows to see what is in them. Is that, there's in fact name and then? Name and then type, yeah. So the order is name and then type. Okay. Okay, so the integer, yeah. Okay, you were right. Great, okay. Now, Desk table uh, fruits. Is it desk and not described? I think it is, yeah. Okay, maybe it's neither. Maybe it's backslash D or something. Boom. Okay, what what does it look like it is? Oh. No, show is for like the, the settings of the so it's not describe what it's declare explain? No, I don't think so. That's explain a query. That's like a so explain is like if you if you are doing a query it will show you the plan that it has come up with to answer the query. Um Yeah. Okay. So we have nothing in fruits and as we had hoped it has an ID and a name. So let's start the naming fruits game. Mangoes we heard before, so so we do insert into fruits. Um, uh, just type uh, uh, yeah name mangoes. 
mango, and quote it, single, single quotes in SQL. Okay. Um, why didn't it? Oh, you have to like auto increment or something. Okay, so let's just put it in then. So I think you can specify it to like automatically. Yeah, okay. Do you want to do that? Alter table. Okay. So we forgot to make it auto incrementing IDs. So let's fix that. So then after you have created a table, you can alter a table. And that's what we're going to do. ID serial. Okay. So. So I should walk that or just create? Well, you could do either one, but let's do alter table just for the sake of tutorial. So alter table fruits, um, ID serial. I think this will work. Oh, bummer. All right. No, get, get, maybe get rid of the friends or something. No, okay, let's look it up. Let's just recreate. Okay, so drop table fruits. You get rid of it by dropping it. Boom, okay. Now let's fix the other one. So if you have data, then obviously you don't want to drop the table. You want to alter it, and then you go look that up online. Um, but if you don't have data, who cares? And then truncate table just leaves the table itself, but gets rid of all the rows in it. And then if you just want to delete specific things, then that's delete from table where something is true, like where ID is thing or where whatever. So, so now we're going to put mangoes in. Okay. Okay. We got mango. Okay. So let's um, select star again to see what's in. So. Yeah. So select is how you get the data out, and star says, show me every column from the results that I get. It's not telling you what results, it's telling you what to show about the results. And then if you just do select star from fruits, that just does everything, so that's usually not what you want to do. Um, so let's do select star from fruits where name equals mango which in this case happens to be the same thing. But equals on like. It's uh, either one, uh, but they're slightly different. So like does a match, or like a regex match. But, okay. So that is where, and then equals should also work. Okay. So, yeah. So it's in there, for sure. So let's get more fruits in there. <laughs> Kiwi. Kiwi. Okay. Grape. Grape. Dragon. Apple. Avocado. Dragon. Durian. What? Durian. What? Durian. Oh, durian. Those are nasty. Avocado. Okay. <laughs> Can we make a nasty nest table? Nothing. Yeah. Well, that's a table. We. Okay, so let's let's see what we've done. Um, how about just select name from fruits, and then because we don't care about these IDs really. Okay, there we go. So we got mango, kiwi, grapes, dragon, durian. Okay, now, yeah. Oh, just, is there a way to like make that to like an array so you don't have to keep keep your stats like? Look, you know, uh, Substack has given you unreal expectations for how quickly people should type on the terminal. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Multiple fruits, like on a single line, or multiple? Multiple insert states. In one, in one. Can you insert multiple fruits with one item? I think, I feel like I've done this before. Um, you just try it. No, but, so, the, what this insert into is it's saying, the first is the columns, and then the second thing is what goes into those columns in the same order. So, um, the batch inserts, I think if you want to do that, you just like create a transaction and have a bunch of insert lines, but yeah, you know, I don't think you can do, do you think you, you can do You would that? be doing it in another language, and then you would be looping over it, inserting the variable name. 
Yeah. So I think someone could come up with a syntax that would let you do that, but I think no one has, but I'm not entirely sure. So so you can, it's up to you to, um, to do that. Okay. So um, great. So now we've got... Uh, we've got that. Okay. So since we want to say that durians are nasty, we're going to create table um, nastiness. And then... Um, so um, we, we need to know what fruit this information refers to, so we will have foreign key something. So, so here's where we get the fun of foreign keys. So a foreign key is a thing that refers to something in another table, and the database makes sure that they are tied together. The uh, name oriented. Um, then we have to, we have to tell it what what table it's a foreign key on. Okay, let's let's go on to the online and see what the syntax for this is. Okay, great. So, great. So now we just we go back and we'll say um, ID references fruits ID. Serial references. No. References? Yeah. ID references fruits. Or maybe, you know, because if it's serial in this one, then it might try to increment it here. So maybe. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, but. Serial might put the auto update or try to put the auto updating logic into this table too, which is not what we need want. So we just want it to be the same data set. Let's try this. Maybe it'll figure it out for us. Close your parent. There we go. Okay. Okay, so we need to give it a type of some sort. So it's an integer probably. Yeah. There's no unique constraint matching we can make these for. This needs to be unique. Let's just call it unique. Unique integer. Is this going to work? Okay. Okay. No, it's not. Should we use their example? No. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we don't. We don't have to have it be referenced. So. If you if you specify that it is a foreign key, then the database will make sure that those references are always um, valid. But we don't really have to do that. We could just make sure that they are on our own since we're not doing much. Why is that? Oh, you like degree of nastiness? Yeah. Okay. Wait, so this is cities, cities, this is thing. So it should be. Oh, table name then. And it's column name, fruits ID. Okay. What is it complaining about? There is no unique constraint. Okay. It wants there to be a unique constraint that parallels that? That doesn't seem to make sense. That one might work, actually. The one's unique, but this is received. Let's just make it an integer, and we'll worry about the integrity of the reference. Okay. So. Okay. So now it's on us to make sure that the IDs match, but we'll just do that. So, and we probably won't at some point, but um, that's part of the fun. So. Uh, now let's insert into nasty. 
emptiness of, and we can do a subselect here too. Um, let's select ID where, no, hold on, insert, insert into, okay, first we need to, let's make a row, insert into nastiness name, or ID, or ID and then, what is it, degree? Level. I shouldn't have used level because that's confusing given the previous. Yeah, okay. Values, and now we can do a sub select so we can. Now, so the ID is going to be select ID from uh, fruits where name equals mango, or no, durian. Um, and then I think you have to parens around the select. And now level is, what's a large number? Anyone? Does anybody know a number larger than 9,000? How about 9,999? With an, yeah, okay. <laughs> there we go. Now let's hope that works. Boom, okay. Now, so now we know how nasty a durian is. So, Let's 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 say we just want to know everything about durians. Um, so how about now if we want to integrate the facts in our database across multiple tables that each have different information about things, then we do a join. So and a join is when you take different tables and match up their rows in a certain way so that they create like a giant table with a bunch of rows from other tables together and it shows you all of the rows at once. So, um, and there are different kinds of joins that uh, correspond to different ways of combining rows together, but most of the time you want an inner join, which is um, just having things that identify the same things and matching them up by their identifiers, roughly. So, um, so we're going to select, um, and there, there are different syntaxes you can use, but the simplest one is to just name multiple tables in the select. So we're going to do select star, from, so all the columns in this join, from uh, fruits, comma, nastiness. Um, and I think you say, like, on to, well, with, with the comma syntax, um, well, I don't know if we want to add, no, because we don't have to rename the columns, there. well, ID is redundant, right? But it's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But if so, yeah. So from fruits nastiness, where fruits dot id equals um, nastiness dot id. Um, that's it. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Where because we just um, uh, I uh, name equals durian. Oh yeah, and name equals durian. No, not where again, just and. Okay, there we go. So now we have all of the information about durians. Um, now up. So was there a? Do we specify a default value, or did it just put a default value in? I made that. Okay. Oh, you you entered it. Okay. And it only showed us things where we had a nastiness row, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. So that's how SQL works. Um, now let's look at Wikipedia. So here is a database that is not about silly fruits, but it's about every silly fact about every silly thing ever, and it's Wikipedia. So now we can ask 
and answer any question about anything in the known universe. So let's see all of the tables that Wikipedia has. This is taking quite a long time. Okay. So there are 108 tables. What, do you know offhand what the interesting ones are? So, so, so page and category. Okay. So like this is geotags, which means that that page has geocoordinates. This is if an image is on that page. IW is into wiki links, so that's connecting languages. Language links. Math means that there has some mathematical notation on it. I think an interesting one is page. So just to give you a default example, let's describe the page. And by the way, you can visit this yourself at foray.wmplabs.org. WMF is Wikimedia Foundation. Okay, so the schema for the page table is, and this, by the way, is not all of Wikipedia, it's just the metadata about articles. So there is a thing that that's a bar binary that I don't know what it is. There's a page counter, so I don't know what that is either, actually. But the page ID is typically something, this is an integer that's eight digits long, and it's unsigned, so it could be negative. And this value indicates if it can be left null or not. No, it can't be negative. Oh, it's unsigned. Oh, it's unsigned, so it can't be negative. Go right. Page is new, page is a redirect. Page, the latest revision of the page, if a thing probably that runs to update the links has been run on it. Um, I don't know what some of those things are, but an interesting one is page title and page ID. So. Okay, so I'm going to select the first 50 IDs and titles from the page table. Okay, so this page is on Chuk Chuk Chuk. That's the internal page ID. These are the first things. This is an album by that title. There's something called Bang. Da da. Oh, you know, we should we should do sorting. Okay, so let's sort this. Yeah, so let's try to get them in, like, in order. So, uh, order by name, was it that? Well, it's page title. Oh, yeah. But we already have page title. Yeah. Well, let's order by page title depending, and then see, like, the last two lexicographically pages first. Okay, so order by is how you order your results, and you can do ascending or descending, and there is, like, a obvious what order numbers come in, and then for strings it does lexicographical sorting of the strings, which is the usual way you're used to in a dictionary. I mentioned that because it has a type system, you can't. One is different than is none. Okay, also, like, in level DB, this has a type system on it, as you can see, because these things have, what did I get wrong? D-S-N-A? and this, oh, wow, that's wonderful. Okay. Oh, it comes, it comes before limit, not after limit. Okay. So because SQL has a type, a type system, in a way that level DB doesn't really, then, well, as I was noticing, I mean, you had to deal with, in the very early days of iTunes, you had to deal with the fact that the numbers in your songs and, like, the was in the wrong place, and it would, like, script your ordering. 
but then I think they put a type system on it or something. And similarly, because these things are typed, because each co each column has a type, it will do the right ordering in the way that you intended it to, rather than one coming before what eleven coming before nine or something. Oh, because that was with all of the what. So yeah, you remember that you had to like stick exclamation points in so that things would sort in the way that you wanted them to, but now you can just, everything is separate and you could sort by each of those things separately if you want. Um, and you don't have to like pack it in by knowing what order characters appear in in the ASCII code system. I think that this is long because it's trying to get every page and then limit it, which means that it's pre-planning this query wasn't very good. Okay, well, actually, since we're ordering by page title, there might not be an index on page title. So, um, and if there's no index on page title, then it probably has to just go through the whole page title table and see. So, could we describe the table, like show, does it show table? Maybe it's show table uh, uh, at table page. Okay, so now we can, what is it? What is Maria DB? Is it, it's desk. Is it described? It's described. Okay, described page. This is Maria. DB. Yeah. Okay. Which is MySQL, but Oracle, but Oracle. <laughs> okay. So does page title have an index? Where do you see it? The bottom. Var binary. What's no? That means it's not null. Okay, not null. How do we see the indexes in MariaDB? I don't um, Let's look it up. Okay, there we go. Show. Show indexes from table name. There's no indexes on it. That's really weird. Okay. So we can't really do any of that. Um, is, is this read only or could we just? It's read only. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So we can't add indexes either. Well, let's join on something here. Okay. So. so we could have seen things ordered by page name. Okay, so yeah. this is the link ID, and this EL from is a page ID number. Okay, this is interesting. So like this is housing, the, an external link to housing.berkeley.edu is uh, on this page. So now we should join on this EL from and the page IDs and get the name. I mean, so the real magic of SQL is that you don't write for loops. 
which you would otherwise do if you had stored all of this in arrays. This is how I understand it. It just takes so long. Sometimes these are like four minute queries because the database is so big. But let's just go back. Well, is it so let's leave this cooking. Is there not even an index on the page ID? That seems almost perverse. Or do they just not copy them over? Can we talk about, can you show us the explain? Okay, you know, that's a great idea right now, actually, is let's take that query and explain it so that we can see why it is taking a long time. So just stick explain out in front of it, I think. Oh, really? Okay, let's do it on this thing. getting into the guts of things. So, as I mentioned before, you describe the results that you want and it figures out how to get them for you, so this is how it does it. So, a, a hash join is something that it can do because um, they, they're indexed, so it can, it can build a table of them. Actually, I'm not sure that's what hash join refers to exactly, but anyway, um, so it's it's going to do a fairly efficient way of of associating the rows from nastiness with the rows with the corresponding rows for fruits, and then it is going to do a sequential scan on nastiness, which is actually very inefficient. But since the table is slow is small, it's saying well, it's a small table, so its cost is still low, so I'll do it anyway, I think. And then um, an analogous thing here again. What hash? What's what? What's the hash? Um, what is that? I don't know. Yeah, what is the hashing? Oh. Does that mean it's... Okay, so it's trying to do a hash join, and then within that it's scanning nastiness to get the IDs, I guess, and then it's sticking them in a hash table, and then it's scanning fruits to find the same thing in fruits. And then, and it did nastiness first, I think, because nastiness is a smaller table, and now it, now it checks that set to just do name equal to durian. Okay, that makes sense. Probably not something that you could come up with or like think about how yeah. you could come up with. So like if you were if you were using level DB then you would write that instead of select blah blah blah. Or you would write something like it that does the same thing but maybe is easier to read but slower. So that is the work that has been done for you. Concluding. Yeah. But it's good. Any so how about that folks? Are there any questions or comments or concerns? Where would you use one database versus the other? No, what would you use this for? What would you use what for? This like particular what relational database. Of, oh, what like, what, like what is a relational database good for? Um, it is good for storing information and retrieving it according to what you want to know about it. Um, so, but that's very general. So often if you are writing a website, you will stick the content of your website in 
and you will have like a table for users and you will have a table for posts written by users and that will be the ID of the user ID will be attached to the post for instance and then that is like your WordPress or your Facebook or whatever and um, what else have that's kind of all anyone ever writes so uh, I don't know um, if you run a bureaucracy you will you will have already come up with these forms and so you can just directly translate the form into tables and then you can query them and you can come up with statistics about whatever your bu bureaucracy is tracking. Um, Max is actually using stuff a lot like this to answer questions about um, the way gender and other traits play into Wikipedia subject matter and authorship, right? Well, I'm going to talk about the data frame later on, which is like a similar but not persistent model of how you might store data. Okay. Tabular data. Which is, is this tabular data? Um, yes, I guess table. so, yeah. Well, I don't know. If you think that a key value pair is a good method, like, could you imagine everything, all of these 108 tables being stored as key value pairs with exclamation points in between? Each thing. I mean, like, this is a heavier thing, and it's less. It's more. It can do more, and has more. It's more expensive in how long it takes to set up, etc. But I think that it's a lot cleaner in the way that you would eventually that it would scale to new things because you wouldn't have to go like you can alter your schema without having to like add one set a table and then. Like you saw that, we know that the user was at the second position of when we split on the bank. But that may not become true, and so it would be better to just, that you wouldn't have to worry about having to go back and change all those twos into threes if you were going to insert something somewhere. Yeah, and, and let's say you've, you've accumulated a lot of different kinds of information over the course of a long period of time, and you have like eight different tables that you're trying to join, and then you have conditions you want to apply on each one of them. And if you're writing it as a SQL query, you can do that in maybe 10 lines, but if you were going to, if you like came up with a plan to execute that query yourself, that might be like, uh, you know, 50 or 100 lines of code to like get it from here and index it to make it efficient and then go and use that to look something else up over here. And that's you know, the difference between the query and the query plan is just going to get bigger and bigger as the question you're asking becomes more complicated. So two, two questions. One is, what does this have to do with the general idea mentioned earlier of uh, saying what you want to do and having the computer to figure out how? And then second question is, um, I didn't understand it. It's like, what, what do the fruits have to do with Wikipedia, I guess? Um, the fruits was just... Um, I think I wanted to do that so that we would really start from the absolute beginning so that you would see how to set everything up and then the Wikipedia is is actual, you know, real data that has been accumulated for a long time and that you can actually do real things with. Um, so now the first question. Um, as I mentioned, 
mentioned before, the SQL way of doing things has been restricted in certain ways to make searching for a plan um, a, tra a, a fairly tractable problem without using very sophisticated techniques. Um, so um, there's, and, and you remember from the query plan, there's this idea of what the cost is of doing a certain thing a certain way in a certain context, and then there's this high-level idea of what the goal is. So, like, the goal is to um, return all of the results that meet certain criteria, and then the possible ways of doing that are different operations you can do to retrieve data from tables and to, you know, uh, index them and use that to subsequently retrieve information from other tables and so on until you piece your answer together. Um, so, um, and, and each one of those has a cost associated with it, so the planner is is taking your description of what you want, which is your overall goal, and then it's figuring out how to, how to get that for you, and it's taking into account this cost of doing things. So that isn't just something, like you could apply the same ideas to any problem where you can articulate a way of measuring the cost of doing something and articulate what you're trying to do and um, come up with some way of, of, uh, of uh, deriving a plan from the description or of searching for plans that meet the criteria or something like that. Can you talk about how that applies to this? Yeah, so it is actually it is actually This a is the coolest thing, by the way. Yeah. Well, this is... This if is this ever works, yeah. then it would be the coolest thing and we would all be going home right now. Well, maybe not, but we would be saving a lot of work and our software would probably work a bit. It would be more correct more of the time. But, um, so log logic is kind of an unfortunate name because um, logic, like predicate logic, isn't very useful for describing the world. Maybe it's out in this but so, yeah, there we, so this is what I think is the real show here, is declarative programming, like you declare, you, you describe the result set, you are declaring your goal, it is explicit, the computer has a way of turning a goal into an efficient plan for executing the goal, you have notions of what it costs to do certain things, and it can look at different orders and different combinations of things that it can do to try to get something that doesn't cost a lot to get you to your goal. Um, this is, it, uh, if, if you do this, then um, you're making your goal explicit and um, the computer is also making sure that whatever you do ultimately meets your goal. Um, and it's saving you a lot of the work of figuring out how to get there efficiently, ideally. Now, to do this in a less restricted domain than SQL is a more challenging technical problem than the SQL problem, um, and that is what I mentioned I am uh, working on, uh, and it's, it's quite a digression to go into the details of that, but um, there, are, there are ways, let's say, of describing the statistical regularities in what follows from what when you try to do a certain thing in a certain context, and you can kind of feed back the information you get from trying things into a model of how your actions affect your progress towards your goal, and then um, you can use that to make plans. Uh, the computer can use that to make plans. So, um, and it's, it's, it's kind of like, uh, like, like right now you write, you write a procedure and you write, if, if you're lucky, you write tests to make sure that the tests are supposed to check certain aspects of whether you've arrived at your goal or not and whether the procedure in a certain context gets you to your goal. But it's all very ad hoc and it's, it's rare that you even have like a formal notion of a test built into the language. Um, and really sophisticated type systems can do some of this 
but you're still just you're you know you're 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 doing the brush strokes. You're not like saying what the painting looks like. And most tools don't let you say what the painting looks like, but declarative programming lets you say that. And then. Um, uh, does that answer your question better? A whole different world, the same yeah. yeah, the corrective programming is a whole different world. So, and you can, there, there's actually a hybrid system that I saw lately, which was, um, it came out of Viewpoints Research Institute, which is strongly associated with Alan Kay, who is the guy who made small talk, one of the people who made small talk uh, a while ago, which is one of the more flexible and easier to use programming languages and more concise ones that has ever existed. Um, but what, and this was by Hassam Samimi, who's also in the same institute, but is like a recent uh, a graduate of a PhD program, I think, who's now doing research there. And he just took Java and added an explicit goal to the methods in Java. So, and if you, so it'll do the procedure that you tell it to do. It'll run your code if you specify any. If you don't, it'll just search. But it, it, it'll also just run your code, and then it'll check at the end to see, did it meet the condition that you specified? And if not, then before failing, it will try to search for a result that does meet that condition and use that instead of the wrong one that your code came up with. So. Even if, and so this is this is a way that these two, uh, the, the like procedural and declarative programming could work together is that you could state your goal explicitly, and there could be a general purpose way of going from from uh, starting conditions to goals that is built into the system, and then you could also specify a specific procedure, and the system could take your procedure into account, and it could also fall back to this general way of getting to goals. Um, and that is a, a, a very intriguing thing because you wouldn't have to rely implicitly on your having come up with something that actually achieves what you're trying to achieve. It would actually be something that the system is looking out for on your behalf. So I think that while, while we're here, we may as well go into the last, like we, we've been talking about programming, but in fact we've only been really seeing examples of make one and maybe one half of another paradise. And today, when we looked at SQL, where we just said select star from blah, 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 and it made a plan for us, that was another paradigm called the declarative paradigm. But in fact, there are even more paradigms than that. And in the painting analogy, the, how would the painting analogy go with object-oriented programming? Well, I might have to come up with a new analogy, actually. Um, let me think. Um, well, there's a really, can we go, can you look up Steve Yegi's uh, Kingdom of Nouns? Uh, Y-E-G-G-E. This is a fun rant about the difference between functional and object-oriented. So there's this other issue that I don't actually think is as important as people often seem to think it is. But their functional programming is gives you a lot of tools for talking about what you're doing. And then object-oriented programming basically um, ha has you describe what things are. So if you're in an, a, a rigidly object-oriented language such as Java has been for most of its history and still largely is, and you just want to make a, you want to write a function that does something, like you know in JavaScript, which we've seen a lot of, you just write function and its arguments and then do stuff and return this. But in Java, you have to have it in an object and then the object is a bundle of information. Object is not a JavaScript object. Yeah. That term is being overloaded at the moment. But it's similar. It's because it has this, it has names for things and what is is named by the name. 
and um, you, but you can't just have a function outside of the context of an object. So if you just want a function to do something to some inputs, then you have to create like a, a fake object with no information associated with it to do that. Um, but really, you need to do both of these things. You need to describe data and data structures, and you need to describe what happens to them if you're going to describe all of a program. So that's, I think, that fact is behind the recent rise of object functional languages that combine object-oriented and functional features, such as Scala or OCaml or um, F Sharp. Um, but this is a fun rant about that stuff, and it's like, it, it just goes on and on, but it's worth reading. And then it ends with this nice rhyme. I'll recite it. For the lack of a nail, throw new horseshoe, horseshoe nail, not found exception, no nails. For the lack of a horseshoe, equestrian doctor, get local instance, get horse dispatcher, shoot. For the lack of a horse, riders guild, get rider notification, subscriber list, get broadcaster, run, new broadcast message, stable factory, get null horse instance. <laughs> This is also a good example of like if you, because you could you could think of these objects as tables. They're actually very similar in what you can do with them. And then if you had to answer the question that in natural languages in this rhyme, then you might actually have to go through all these steps. But to to go through them explicitly is quite tedious, which we'll continue to do. For the lack of a writer, message delivery subsystem get logger log delivery failure. Message, and I'm not even specifying nesting in the form of, of field accesses or parenthesization here. Message factory, get abstract message instance, new message medium, message type verbal, new message transport, message transport type mounted rider, new message session destination, battle manager, get rooting info, battle location nearest, message failure, reason code, unknown rider failure. For the lack of a message, Battle notification sender, battle resource mediator, get mediator instance, get resource, battle participant, proxy participant, battle resource, battle notification sender, send notification. And do you even know what's going on at all? I kind of do, but battle notification builder, battle resource mediator, get mediator instance, get resource, battle organizer, get battle participant, battle participant, good guys, battle resource, battle notification builder, build notification. Battle organizer, get battle state, battle result, battle lost. Battle manager, get chain of command, get command chain notifier. And this is really what the code really looks like. And then you, you really have to go and read code that looks like this. And it's about this fun, except you're not e people aren't even laughing at you. You're just like laughing sadly at yourself. <laughs> For the lack of a battle, try synchronized battle information router lock, get lock instance, battle information router lock, get lock instance, wait. Catch interrupted exception nine, or X. If battle session manager, get battle status, battle resource, get localized battle resource, locale, get default, battle context, create context, kingdom, get master battle coordinator instance, new tweed beetle, puddle, paddle, battle, populate. I can't believe I said that right the first time. Region manager, get armpit province, armpit leftmost, <laughs> battle status lost. If logger is loggable, level totally screwed, logger, log screwage, battle logger, create battle log message, battle status format or format, battle status, lost war, locale, get default. It's almost done. For the lack of a war, new service execution, join point, distributed query analyzer, forward query result, notification schema manager, get abstract schema mapper, new publish subscribe notification schema, get schema proxy, Execute, publish, subscribe, query plan, notification schema, alerts, new notification schema, priority, schema, priority, max priority, new publisher message, message factory, get abstract message, message type written, new message transport, message transport type wounded survivor, new message se session destination, destination manager, get null destination for query plan, Distributed war machine, get party role manager, get registered parties, party role manager, party king, party role manager, party general, party role manager, party embed or the all or all those things. Get query result, priority message dispatcher, get priority dispatch instance, wait for service, all for the lack of a horseshoe nail. Okay. That might be the first ever dramatic reading of that poem. Okay. I can't
can't really top that, so I'm done. <laughs> Did our Wikipedia query finish? No, but I just formatted it nicely so that we changed it to page title and the external links too, and so now you see which, we know which page titles go to which external links exist and which page titles. So I'll be glad to help you out with more of that. Okay, great. So if you want to query Wikipedia or another thing, then here, here we are. So that should be uh, not very convincing, but possibly funny.